Hey everyone, good evening. It's uh, seven o'clock straight up, I think. I think, right? So uh, good to see everyone both here in the building for the first time and also online. So this is our first time back in the building uh, since they allowed us to open things up. And as I look around the room, there's probably, uh, what, about 10, 12 of us in the room. Um, but uh, again, just want to welcome everybody to our Bible, our Wednesday night Bible study here at Ascent Bible Church. Uh, for those of you that uh, may not know, uh, we're located in the most beautiful place on the planet, a place called Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I just want to welcome everybody tonight. Um, <clears throat> this has been uh, basically our Q&A Bible study for the last couple months since we've been apart. And uh, we chose to do it this way so that we could um, focus on some things that people may be concerned about as we're going through this transition, this time as a, as a country, as a planet, as a world, uh, this, this pandemic that we're all dealing with, just to kind of um, maybe um, uh, just be able to focus and, and isolate on some specific issues or things or concerns um, that people may have. And then I just want to remind you, keep in mind that everything that we're going to say and do is going to be right out of God's word. So it always begs the question. It's something that we challenge everybody in this church, <clears throat> and I would you as well, um, those of you that are online, is to always ask the question, what does the Bible say? So whatever it is, you know, we can always have the answer and the solution in God's word. So that's, our, that's kind of our premise in anything and everything that we try to do here. So what we've been trying to do on, on Wednesday nights, and we've been looking at a lot of, of what I would term doctrinal or theological things out of the Bible, uh, and we're trying to balance that out with some more practical kinds of things on Sunday mornings. So on Sunday mornings, we're, our goal is to uh, look at words of the week and themes um, and um, really try to drive home and uh, encourage you to stay in God's Word, be in God's Word, uh, so that when we're teaching you stuff or you're hearing things on the news and you're dealing with who knows who and what uh, anymore in, on this planet and all the confusion and uncertainty, um, we're trying to equip you so that you can always uh, turn to God's Word to get the answer. Um, believe me, I don't have all the answers, but if there's a, an issue that comes up, I want us to always be able to <clears throat> um, get into God's Word and let Him reveal to us exactly what it is that we need to be doing. So there's kind of our balance. So those of you that are part of our church and have been following us online since we've been apart, uh, this Sunday uh, we are starting a whole new series that I think everybody's going to enjoy. Um, we started last fall in our church with this whole notion or this theme call on faith. We started with the series in both October, November, and early December on um, on the foundations of faith, and then we started jumping into some Hebrews 11 stuff so that we can see some examples out of the Bible of these great men and women of God that demonstrated so much faith in the Old Testament, and with the idea that we would be getting into the book of Joshua uh, at some point this year. Here we are in June, half the year's almost gone, isn't that crazy? Half the year's almost gone, and um, we're starting Joshua on June 7th, uh, this Sunday. Um, and the theme of that book is going to be faith for the future. Um, that was the theme that we came up in our Vision 2020 document for this church, knowing and realizing that um, we would be experiencing some challenges in 2020. And sure enough, man, right from the onset, it seems like things got really crazy really quick in 2020. Um, here we are halfway through the year. And we've already been dealing with um, a pandemic and, and now some craziness going on in our country. We've had some ele an election yesterday with a lot of transition and changes going on. And uh, who knows what uh, November is gonna, <laughs> gonna bring. Uh, but nonetheless, I want us to realize and never forget and always remember that whatever goes on in this world, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, man, because he's the only one that's going get to get us through <clears throat> through all this craziness and uh, bizarreness that I think we're all experiencing. So again, want to welcome everybody tonight. Um, I just want to give everybody a little bit of a, a heads up on some things in the facility. 
Uh, we've tried to adapt our building to uh, do stuff, more stuff online. It kind of forced us to do this. So we're still having a lot of challenges with lighting. So let me just <clears throat> apologize ahead of time um, that um, you may not be able to see a couple of the slides that, but I think you're familiar with. So if you remember from our, your booklet, if you've got your booklet, let's go ahead and pull them out. Does everybody have a booklet? Um, I hope everybody's got a booklet. If you, everybody know what I'm talking about? I, I mean, does it? Um, so here's the deal. We're going to be referring to the booklet and what we're going to try to do, I'll get with George Martin and see if we could adapt some of the more uh, brighter, the brighter slides that don't show up in this room as well, darken them up a little bit so that they do show up uh, on the screens. But <clears throat> what is cool about our building, when they designed this building, it was a school and uh, they brought in a lot of natural light with skylights, which is really neat. But we've had to <laughs> we've had to kind of shade them a little bit so that we could darken up the stage, the platform, and uh, make it more conducive to doing this video stuff. So uh, that's a little bit of our challenge. I think things will get a little bit better. Um, well, things will get a little bit better for us uh, once uh, it starts to get dark outside. Um, it is seven. Well, I don't even know what time it gets dark anymore. Probably about quarter to eight or so. Uh, whatever the time is, um, it might improve in this room once we see the back darkening up a little bit. So, again, let me apologize ahead of time for those of you that are going to be uh, watching this online. There's probably a couple of screens you won't be able to see, but I will explain them as best I could. But I, I, as, a, as a heads up, uh, the actual two slides that we keep referring to are found in the book. Um, turn to page number 12, which is your dispensational chart it's the chart that we throw up every wednesday night uh, so if you can keep that in front of you we're going to kind of start there like we always do the one thing that we're doing in our church is reminding people each and every week and as often as we can i do it in discipleship as well uh, when i'm discipling somebody one-on-one -on -one, is let them and make sure that they're understanding the fact that there's a plan in place that god has a plan and he's got a purpose for us and he's got a plan for us. And what we can't lose sight of, just like all these characters that we studied last fall out of Hebrews 11, uh, from, from Abel all the way to, uh, to Joshua and all these characters and all these guys that show up, um, whenever these folks show up, they, God put them on the planet at that point in time to, to use them for his glory, to bring about... Uh, some truth and some revelation about how it is that he works in our lives. So that said, it, nothing has changed with God in terms of how he relates to us and deals with us. He too has a purpose and a plan for us. Um, as a matter of fact, our, um, our technical dude, our cameraman, just walked in the door. So Marvin, could I give you this real quick? Because I was going to run it from here. I just have two views. So excuse us for a sec, folks. Um, me and the screen, and then one just the screen by itself. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so just so whenever I may be pointing to the screen, uh, just hit that mute. Okay. Um, and I appreciate Marvin because he's uh, been instrumental. Oh, so he's been, a lot of this stuff out has been such a blessing. That's good. Um, we will be um, white, white was. We will be improving the video stuff, especially on Wednesdays and Sunday mornings, and when we do go live as we improve our network in here. So I'm hoping uh, that whatever we do here tonight, live also continues to work throughout the evening as we do this Bible study over the next two hours because we're actually using a little cell phone and talking to Verizon uh, to get to, to be live so that we can go live. So once we get our network in and Sylvia pays the bills, we can, uh, we, uh, we can get that circuit off, we can get that circuit in here. And, I've been told it's going to be pretty robust, pretty powerful, and uh, we'll be able to stream stuff all over in all the classrooms and everything. So, um, just, uh, again, just really excited to be back in the building. Um, uh, for me, it's been a normal kind of thing. We've spent a lot of time here in the last couple yeah. months okay. just trying to fix things up and make it more <coughs> to, do the, to doing the online mm -hmm. stuff. But man, it's it's just a building without, without soul in it. And it's not the church. It's uh, the building is there, um, and we refer to it often as a facility, yeah, or the facility, or the building. 
of the church building, but it's here to facilitate ministry. And uh, we're blessed to have this great facility, this great building. Um, even the location where it is here in Santa Fe is, is such an incredible blessing. But at the end of the day, man, the church are the people that are sitting in this room right now and those that are you out there online. And uh, that's the body of Christ. And without the hearts and the souls and the minds of the people that make up the church, um, it's uh, it's just not the same. And uh, Marvin, who spent a lot of time here, my wife Larry and Larry Sosha and the praise team will tell you that it's been kind of weird <laughs> being here just uh, the five or six of us throughout um, throughout most of the spring. Uh, but it's good. It's good to be back, even though our numbers are small because of some of the uh, requirements still from the state. I'm hoping and I'm praying that that'll change and things will open up completely for us in the coming weeks. Um, but with that said, um, man, I always look forward to Bible study. Um, let me just say up front that you guys have done a tremendous job with the questions. Um, Arlene, I want to just commend you on... The mic is uh, on his the phone. Own. It's because you don't have a mic. Oh, is it so really? So they can't hear. They can't hear me? Did they already tell you they can't? So leave it up here? I could do that, Marvin. Okay, cool. See, thanks to Marvin, we uh, already figured out a technical thing. I should have been using the mic on the thing, huh? Yeah, okay. It's too late to start over. What do they do in a Hollywood cut? Start over? No cuts, man, because we're already 15 minutes into this thing. Um, that works. Um, can you? Can everybody hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Is that a Verizon commercial? Can you hear me now? Yeah. But no, I was I was just mentioning Arlene earlier because it's been really cool, Arlene, and and thank you for investing in Donna Gomez because Donna Gomez between Donna Gomez and Kathy Pino, man, they're the ones asking questions every week. But it just again proves what's going on in people's lives whenever they're spending time in God's Word and they're learning and they're growing because God, the Spirit of God, just begins to. Uh, put stuff in their minds and in their hearts about what to ask and um, again it's been awesome so um, are we good everybody can hear me now yeah. I, okay good. good how about in here am I talking loud enough in here Ollie okay good um, so welcome uh, just again a uh, couple little ground rules if you will things have changed a little bit because we're together for the first time in the room but uh, I'm hoping you can see this slide okay online. There's a, I know there's a washing out over here a little bit, but um, I just want to let everybody know that if you do have a question, uh, just email it to Bible study at ascent Bible church. That is our domain name. So Bible study at ascent Bible church. And then over here is my personal cell phone, 505-670-2986. You can also text me a question, and that's usually how I get most of them. Uh, but nonetheless, feel free. So if I'm saying something or something is said on Wednesday nights or maybe something that you heard or something that you're dealing with, um, uh, something that you heard online perhaps, don't hesitate to reach out and ask and we'll p kind of put it in the queue. The question that was asked or is being asked tonight is, um, is a really great question. It was a question sent to me or texted to me by, by Kathy, Kathy Pino right on Sunday afternoon right after church uh, it's a great question so here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna give you guys a heads up real quick um, this is a heavy question it's a deep question um, in in the sense that it's no way are we gonna be able to answer it all on uh, all tonight there's just so much um, so much there and I'm gonna pose it here in a minute but um, so just as an FYI, um, if you do have a question, I may kind of um, put it up in a, put it on the shelf for a couple of weeks till we get through this because I want to make sure that this question that we're going to pose in a minute um, is um, is laid out thoroughly because it's it's a great question and there's just so much that the Word of God has to say about what she's asking that it's going to take at least and you'll see why in a minute three weeks. To cover it so that'll take us through today's the third 10th 17th so um, by the 24th we'll start kind of uh, kind of fresh with another question all right so um, again great to see everybody those of you that are online uh, my wife Larry Romero is sitting here on her surface kind of tracking uh, who's coming online so if you have a question online just let her know and uh, she'll ask it 
And again, those of you that are in the room, don't hesitate if something is said. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and we are going to get into God's Word. I'll tell you what, before we get into God's Word, let me tell you where to turn in God's Word. Go to Revelation chapter 4. This is where we're going to camp out, just to kind of get us there right away before we pray, and that way we can dive right into the text, and we can dive right into uh, to, uh, Kathy Pino's question. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much, man. What a blessing to be together again. As I look around this room, uh, Lord, I'm so grateful for these precious folks that you have put in my life. So grateful to finally be able to see them and connect with them in the last couple of weeks, Lord. And as I pray, and I pray, Lord, that as we uh, continue on pressing on, Lord Jesus, with this great purpose and mission that you have given to the church and to each and every one of us individually, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, continue to enlighten us. Lord, thank you for leading us and preparing us for these days as we considered our vision statement back in, our vision document back in the fall, Lord, and how you led us to this whole theme about faith. And And I pray, Lord, that our faith grows, that, uh, Lord, we come to this place and and um, in a time and, and in an area in our lives Lord, where we're trusting you in everything and anything, Lord, and uh, knowing and realizing that, Lord Jesus, you are not the author of confusion, but, Lord, you are uh, the one that provides clarity in, in chaotic and often confusing and dark times. Use us tonight, Lord Jesus, for your glory. I thank you again for this question that was asked. I pray now that you would just open our hearts, our minds to your word and allow your spirit to reveal, to teach and um, open up your word, Lord Jesus, to us as we uh, look into this very profound truth. Uh, Lord, we come to you now. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, amen. All right, everybody there in uh, Revelation chapter 4. Um, I'm going to read the passage here in, in a minute. It's, uh, it's a short chapter, but man, it's a profound chapter in terms of the subject matter that we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, and um, I'm not going to unpack it like we normally do and do a kind of an expository verse-by-verse verse thing with it, but we're going to highlight some thoughts and some things out of it that I want you to be mindful of and be aware of as we start getting into this Bible study and consider um, what is being asked and the significance of this chapter, the chapter that follows it, chapter number five, and then there's a third chapter that I'm going to show you here in a minute. But uh, um, before we get into the chapter, I hope you're already there. Here's the question. It was asked, uh, it was posed to me last Sunday, right after church. And it's a question from Kathy Pino, and she's asking the question, and this came about, obviously, and this is a good thing, came about because of some of the discussion that we had last week, I think, from the, uh, the uh, virus thing and, uh, and vaccinations and all the other stuff. Um, and I think what spawned the question, and what I've come to realize is <clears throat> when people are asking some of these questions, they're really more... It's, it's somewhat of a cover unbeknownst to them subconsciously. They ask a question about, they might be asking a question about, about viruses and, and vaccinations or whatever. But at the end of the day, as, as you really stop and consider a person's heart or where they're coming from, they're really asking, man, am I taking the mark of the beast? You know, am I going through the tribulation period? And I think we were able to address that and, and deal with that in a way where we were able to give some hope and I think we drove home the issue of the rapture of the church and the purpose of the church and all that comes with that and its significance and its profoundness because I think once we laid that whole thing out and the fact that you as the body of Christ, you're not going through that that period known as the tribulation period or the great tribulation period. That said, Kathy's asking the question, all right, since I'm not going through that thing, Right? I think that was perhaps confirmed last week. And if not, we'll talk a little bit more about the rapture. Uh, if not tonight, some other time. She's asking the questions, all right, what are we do, going to do in heaven with the Lord during the tribulation period? In other words, you were talking about all this crazy and nuts, nutty stuff that's going to be happening on planet Earth. And you, we're going to be raptured out, the church. We're going to be in heaven with the Lord. What is it that we're going to be doing? And then she has a kind of a follow-up. Can we see what's taking place on earth? That's kind of a two-part question, but 
Um, I think it confirmed in her heart that, man, praise God, I'm, we're not going to be here. I'm not going to be here. But nonetheless, she's wanting to know what are we actually going to be doing? What's going to be happening? Well, you're going to get your little wings. You're going to float around when God's going to give you a little violin or a harp, actually. And you'll float around for seven years. And to answer this second part, a bow and arrow for, uh, for, uh, for Clyde Hayes, the hunter. Um, so that's the first question. We already answered that. Kathy, are you good with that? And then the second part of her question was, can we see what's going on? And I'm going to say yes. All right? So we're done. All right, next question. No, I'm kidding. This is a really cool question, really profound question, because frankly, a lot of Christians don't really know what's going to be going on in heaven and not even in heaven during the tribulation period, because that's going to be our focus in the three weeks, these seven years that are going on on planet Earth. What is God going to be doing with us? What are we going to be a part of? What are we going to be experiencing? What are we going to be witnessing? What are we going to see? What are we going to be doing? Great question. Because when He comes back, and we come back with Him in the second coming, again, look at your chart, right? And I wish... Um, I wish I had the Revelation chart in this book. Um, I'll get with George. Um, and again, I want to remind everybody, the reason why the Revelation chart is not in this little booklet is because we published this book, I think the first version. Sylvia, you have the original version, right, with the white cover. Uh, in 2017, I think, is when um, George and I first started putting it together. And the, the second version is the one with the little brown uh, How to Study the Bible logo on it. Um, well, anyway, um, we'd, we don't have the Revelation stuff in here. A lot of the Revelation charts that we do have and we've made up available uh, in, the last, in the last year because we spent all of 2019 studying the book of Revelation together. So we will work on version three of this little booklet. I, there's about five or six more diagrams that I want to get here, but I do want to point you to page 21 because this will help you get a visual, especially for those of you that may not be able to see these charts online. As I look at the, as I'm looking at my, at my phone right here where the camera's pointing, man, it's pretty white. All right, now over here. So again, let me apologize for those of you that are online. But if you turn to page 12, this is the, this, if you turn, if you've got the booklet and you turn to page 12, this is the uh, uh, 11 by 14. Is it 11 by 14? Eight and a half by four. What is this size? Is this? I don't know. Who knows? You office people. Eleven by fourteen. Thanks, Marie. This eleven by fourteen document is really key. It's important that you know this, that you understand, that you grasp this, because this is God's plan for the ages. This is God put this thing together in place in His Word. We call it a a dispensational timeline or a dispensational perspective to God's plan and purpose for mankind. From Adam all the way to the end of the age. So whenever you're studying the book of Revelation, you're actually focusing on the section of this chart that goes from the cross to the, to the last kind of parenthetical thing where it says eternity future. That Where it says eternity future, that would be Revelation chapters 21 and 22. Where you're looking at this section there where it says the church age or grace, that's Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So if you look at number 21, page 21, now we'll drill down a little bit, right? Do you guys need a booklet, Mark? Do you have, do you need one? Okay. If you look at page 21, you'll see a little kind of a higher level overview of the book of Revelation. And if you remember from our study, I believe it was last week, the book of Re Revelation is divided into three parts by the two significant events where you find heaven opening. In Revelation chapter 4, 1, heaven opens and somebody goes up. We talked last week about who that is, right? Who is it? Dish? Who is it that goes up in Revelation 4, 1? The church. We call that the what? The rapture. So this is, once the rapture happens, that's Tish's, not Tish's, uh, Pat, uh, what's her name again? Kathy Pino's question. It's Kathy's uh, Pino's question tonight is, what are we going to do? Once, one, what are we going to be doing once we get raptured out for those seven years? Because guess what? You will be coming back with him the second time heaven opens, which is in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, where open, heaven opens a second time. 
We know that as the second coming. And in between those two major events, you find what I call the craziest, most bizarre time that this planet has ever seen. It's known, those seven years are known as the tribulation period. And as we saw last week in Revelation 13, we were looking at the mark of the beast, verse 5, it's divided into halves, right? 42 months. Those 42 months, those second 42 months where it gets really crazy, really bizarre, is known and Jesus uses this phrase. I'm coining the phrase that Jesus used in Matthew 24. He calls it the what? The Great Tribulation. I think it says Great Tribulation here. I don't think, no, it doesn't. But that's okay. But if you look at the little green lines, if you will, where it says Revelation chapters 4 and 5, where did I turn and tell you to turn tonight? I told you to turn to Revelation chapter. What does it say next to chat, the 4 and 5? Heavenly events. We're going to talk tonight and in the next couple two in the next two weeks what those three heavenly events are. There's three of them that you will be involved with. There's three very unique and specific events that are mentioned in Revelation chapters four and five that we're going to unpack. Actually, the third event doesn't show up in chapters four and five. The third event shows up we're actually in chapter number nineteen. And I'm going to show you what those are. So, again, those of you that are familiar with the Revelation chart, right? Everybody up here, the people that are in the room, those of you that are online, you probably can't see this because of the white background. But this is where we stuck those heavenly events. Does everybody have the, the Revelation chart with you? You don't have it with you? That's okay. Arlene does. In this red box... We put the red box and we put it in red and we identified the three heavenly events. That we, these are the things that we will be involved with. These is, this is what we will be experiencing while the world goes through the tribulation period. So Kathy's question is, what are we going to be doing and what, are we going to be able to see what's happening? We're going to see tonight and next week in the following, what we're going to be doing. And to answer the second part of your question, yes, you will be very much involved in observing what's going to be going on on the planet. So what are the three events? And again, those of you, again, apologize online. You can't see this box. The folks in the room can. But these are the three events. These are the three events. The first event, and this is what we're going to talk about tonight, is known as the judgment seat of Christ. Next week, we're going to look at the second event, which is found in Revelation chapter number 5. Okay? And we know that is the seven seals book reveal, or the revelation of the book with seven seals. What is that book? What does that book represent? That is a fascinating truth. This second event that you will experience while you're in heaven after the rapture is the event that will answer the second part of Kathy's question was, will we be observing and watching what's going on on the planet? Absolutely you will. And then the third and final event doesn't show up in either Revelation 4 or 5, but where does it show up? Chapter 19. This is an amazing event. And this is a great event for the church and we know it as the what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. Mark those three events down. Those are the three keys. And again, those of you like Arlene who have your revelation chart handy, some of you online might have this. Open it up and you'll see in the red box these three actual events. This is what we'll be witnessing. This is what we'll be a part of. This is what you and I will be experiencing in... Um, in the future, in heaven, while the world goes through the seven years. Now what's really cool, if you look at page 21 again in your little booklet, where you see the second coming, this is where you find the horses, and there's Jesus up front, uh, there's me way in the back on my burrow, I'm chasing Kristen, who's got her, uh, her barrel horse, and she's really flying down um, Megiddo and through the Jezreel Valley. That said, when we come back with him, the future event that's going to happen prophetically, we know it as the millennium, right? The thousand year reign. And guess what you'll be doing then? You're given two titles or two functions, you and I. You will be kings and you will be priests. You'll be ruling and reigning with Jesus 
for those thousand years. And what is the purpose and role of a peace, priest, Marvin? We were talking about yesterday, discipleship. Minister. To minister. You will be ministering somewhere on this planet. Probably encouraging people. All right, pack up your stuff. Let's go to Jerusalem every fall at the Feast of Tabernacles. To what? To worship Christ. Those things that this Jewish dispensation where now the kingdom is on earth and the king is in Jerusalem and he's reigning from a throne, literal, physical, literal throne in Jerusalem and the world comes to Jerusalem just like they did with David and Solomon in the Old Testament to worship him, to seek his wisdom and guidance and perspective, ruling and reigning with him for those thousand years. Remember the theme of the Bible? What is it? That's it. It's all about a kingdom. The theme of the Bible is about a battle for a kingdom and a throne. It's that simple. God moves, Satan counters. This is an important thing to consider because next week when we look at the second one in Revelation chapter 5, there's a huge revelation, not book of Revelation, but a huge revelation that God's going to reveal to us about what we'll observe and what it is that God is going to do, what Jesus is going to be doing from a throne in heaven to bring redemption and to bring restoration to this planet. A Jewish kingdom, a Jewish king, peace on earth finally. Man, doesn't this world desperately need peace right now? Did everybody get a chance to listen to a Sunday sermon on peace? I'll tell you what, although we're not seeing it physically and literally on the planet right now or in our country, maybe even in our communities, you can experience peace in your heart spiritually if you just trust and depend on the Lord Jesus Christ to get you through this whole thing. So, these are the three. These are the three, uh, the three heavenly events that you and I will be engaged with and involved with in the future when all the stuff is going on on planet Earth. Again, if you look at um, page 21, just to give you that synopsized version of the book of Revelation... Um, we have Revelation chapters 4 and 5, handle events, and look at the second line. Revelation 6 through 19 reveal to us what? Okay. Earthly events. These are things from chapter 6. So most of the book of Revelation, the focus are the thing, the focus is what's going to be happening on this planet, on this earth, from chapter 6 all the way to 19. And even 20. Because by the time you get to chapter 20, that's a literal physical planet on the earth. But really, 6 to 19, the focus is the tribulation period. And then in chapter 19, verse 11, heaven opens, and that second coming event occurs. We come back with him, and we rule and reign, and we have that role of priests and kings in the millennium with Jesus Christ. So, I hope this makes sense. These are the three events. And so tonight, I want to talk to you about... Um, tonight I want to talk to you about um, um, I want to talk to you about uh, I'm running the camera here um, the judgment seat of Christ which is the first of these three events alright so um, Revelation chapter 4 I'm going to read the text now chapter 4 and listen closely to some of the words because they're so profound now keep in mind, verses 1 and 2 speak of the rapture event. Rapture happens in, in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And from chapter three, verse from chapter 4, verse 3, all the way to the rest of the chapter. Again, it's a small chapter to verse 11. Um, it's uh, judgment seat of Christ stuff going on. However, keep in mind that this isn't the only passage in the Bible or in the New Testament specifically that speaks of the judgment seat of Christ. You'll see that tonight. We're going to define what the judgment seat of Christ is, its purpose. So the implication is, here we're looking at a judgment referred to in the Bible as, as and you'll find this phrase, judgment seat of Christ, twice in Scripture, two times and only two times. Isn't it interesting, or do you find it interesting, church, that you will be going through a judgment in heaven someday. But it begs the question, what is the purpose of that judgment? What, is it, what does it all mean? What is, it, what, what, what is what? And again, everything that God does always has 
a purpose. So look with me in chapter 4, verse 1, and it says this, And after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. There's that door, right? Only two places in the Revelation where that happens. Here's the first one. And the first voice which I heard, was it, was it, was it worth, as was it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, listen, here's the phrase, come up hither. That come up hither is the term rapture or to be caught up. Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. John is raptured out, who is a picture, who is a type of the church. And all of a sudden, man, the minute and the instant that he's there, he witnesses somebody sitting on a throne. In a physical, literal heaven. Look at verse 3. And he that sat on it, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now I'm going to just suggest to you, because we're not going to have the time or the energy tonight to unpack all these verses and talk about who these elders are, but if you would go back to our study back in uh, probably April or May of last year when we were doing our book of Revelation study, I went verse by verse on this section and we explained who these guys are and all these players <clears throat> because our focus tonight is the judgment seat. Marvin has a question. Oh, I'm on the edge. Thanks, Marvin. How can you tell? Are you watching? Okay. Where is it? Right here? Bend down and read the Bible. Okay, okay. Let me bring that in. We're having to adapt a little bit, everybody, because this is our first time back in the building. Is that better? Pardon me? Or you, Larry? Whoever? That looks good where you're at now. Okay. But if you read. Okay. Are the lights being an issue? No, no, lights are okay. Okay. So where are we? What verse? Verse number. Uh, Number four, and round about the throne, okay, we already read that, verse five, and out of the throne, here's a cool verse, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, mark this verse down, because this verse is going to be key into some things that we're going to discuss next week, because this, this, this theme of lightnings and thunders and voices will show up four times for a very unique purpose in the book of Revelation. So this is one of those little transition points, if you will. Watch this. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. If you remember, we talk about who these beasts are, right? I think three or four Bible studies ago. So if you're curious or interested, go back to that Bible study. I don't remember the, the date. We can get it for you. But we define or explain who these guys are. Look at verse 7. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Verse number 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to what? Okay. Is to come. He's coming, right? These guys are praising the Lord. There's your setting. It's, who do you suppose is sitting on this throne? Jesus. None other than Jesus Christ, man. And this sea of glass thing is an important thing to consider because we'll talk about that in a couple weeks when we get into the whole Revelation 20, 19 and 20 thing. Look at verse number uh, 9. And those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, they fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him and liveth forever and ever. And look at this one. And they did what? And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, what, what did they do? They cast crowns. Anybody familiar with the band Casting Crowns? They put out some really cool music. Up. That's where they got their name. Now, begs the question, what are these crowns? You're going to hear and you're going to learn what, that, what they are tonight. There's a reason why th these crowns exist. 
So it begs the question, who are these 24 guys? Why are they there? What do they represent? And what do these crowns have to do with you and me? Really profound, really significant. Verse number 11, and this is how the chapter closes. I love this verse. This verse, perhaps like no other verse in all the Bible, really speaks of God's plan and why you and I were created, why you exist. The whole notion of, of origin, meaning, and destiny. When you start, start asking questions in your life, in your life's journey, where did I come from? Why am I here and where am I going? Look at verse 11. For thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You and I exist. Look at the rest of the verse. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are. And they were what? Created. So why do you suppose God created you? To glorify Him. He created you, He created me for a purpose. You and I exist for one reason and one reason only, and that is to glorify God. Now begs the question, what does that mean? What does it mean to glorify God? This is what this whole judgment seat of Christ thing is about. This judgment is what reveals to us your purpose and my purpose and how it is that we glorify God, not in the future, not when we're casting crowns, but in this life, this life that you are privileged to, to have, to be a part of. It is no coincidence that God put you specifically, you and I, together in this city, in this place, in this time, for a reason. Those are the things that we can't lose sight of. That is the big picture. We can't ever forget why it is that we exist. That's why we throw this timeline up on the screen each and every week and remind you, man, that you are part of a plan of redemption. God's plan to redeem a universe, a planet, and a life. So, what does the judgment seat of Christ mean is what we're getting at tonight. Let me give you a couple bit of, or let me give you a little bit of context first and foremost. In the Bible, if you turn to page, I believe it's number 18 in the booklet. Um, let, me, let me find it real quick. Take your booklets and turn to page number 18. It is, it is page 18. Um, I call this page the seven sevens. The seven sevens in, for, in the New Testament that are, explicitly directed to the church, obviously except for the seven feasts, which are also in here, and the 70 weeks of Daniel. But if you look down to the, the third section down, you will find what I call or what are referred to as the seven judgments. There are seven judgments in the New Testament that reveal to us this whole notion or concept of judgment. Seven. Now here's what's interesting. Out of the seven, and you only see three on this screen, right? These three judgments, think about this, because I'm going to point to you out there. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, these are ours. I'll mention, if you look at your page, or if I'm going I'm to throw them up on the screen here in a minute, but there's four more judgments that we're going to briefly consider. So if these are our judgments, what's judgment number three? The judgment. the judgment seat of Christ. This whole judgment thing. Now here's what I want you to consider. These are our judgments. We'll talk about the other four here in a minute. These are the ones we own. That's why I put them on a separate page because these are ours. Here's what you have to be mindful of. The day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior was the day that you and I were judged as sinners. Your sin and my sin was judged at the cross the day that you accepted Him as your personal Savior. We were all separated from God because of what? Original sin. Because of Adam's sin, right? For by one man's sin entered the world and death by sin. Right? Romans 5.12. So we all inherited this fallen nature, this what I refer to often as the human condition. And because of that 
original sin, that Adamic nature that we all, right, for all have sinned. Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23 says what? For all have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. Isn't that interesting? That you were created, you and I were created as believers. Here you have this Revelation 4.11 verse in the context of the rapture says what? That you were created for His glory. You and I can't glorify Him as lost people. So the first step that somebody has to take in the first judgment that anyone has to experience in order to get to number three is to know and realize that your sin was judged on the cross and God judged it. At, you were judged as a sinner. And once you get saved, now you become what? You become a child of God. From a theological and doctrinal perspective, even the, you ladies in the room and you ladies out there online, the Bible refers to you, to you as a son of God. Why a son? Anybody have any clue why the Bible refers to you? Somebody turn to John chapter 1, verse 12. Listen to this, quote, this verse. John chapter 1, verse 12. This is uh, John speaking of of what John the Baptist was saying is the world was finally realizing who Jesus was and why he came. It says this in verse number 12, chapter 1, verse 12. It says uh, of John here in verse number 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Not John the gospel writer, but John the Baptist. The same came to witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That was God's plan from the onset, right? With Adam even. Was that we manifest God's light. Look at the next verse. Verse number uh, 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Isn't that a fascinating verse? That this Jesus that came the first time was the same Jesus that created the universe way back in Genesis 1.1. When we find the verse, in the beginning God created what? The heaven and the earth. And the six days of creation. And now look at verse 12. But as many as received Him, received who? Received Jesus. But as many as received Him, to them He, be, he, he gave power to what? To become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Why are you ladies referred to as sons of God? Anybody have any idea? We talked about it a couple Sundays ago and we were looking at perspective and your place. Why are you referred to as a son of God? Anybody have any clue? Go ahead and type your, your suggestion to Larry out there if you have any idea. Anybody remember? We've talked about this a couple times. Go ahead, Sylvia. I know you know. You're a joiner with Jesus? That's a partial answer. Here's what. Here's why. The instant that you got saved, the day that you received him, the day that you said that you did Romans 10, 9, and 10, you believed in your heart, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. The day that you got saved, the Holy Spirit indwelled you. Who's the Holy Spirit? It's Jesus. This is why you have the power and I have the power. Ladies, you, you always hear us say, man, our, not just ladies and dudes and dudettes, all of us together, the, our purpose and our mission and the way we glorify God is what? To become more like Christ. Well, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, Christ is a he. Regardless of what people are doing to the Bible with these new translations and removing genders and everything else, I had, I had a, uh, somebody who's very close to me the other day ask me, not sarcastically, not scoffing or anything, how do you know that God is in a woman? Well, you know what that said to me immediately right, off, right away? You know what it says to me immediately? That he doesn't believe who Jesus Christ is. That the whole notion and, 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 and depth and beauty of, of the doctrine of, 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 of the Trinity and the, and the doctrine of the Godhead, that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, 
is being denied and rejected by people. I mean, I, just this past week, there's this whole thing being pushed out on the internet about the very existence of the historical Jesus that he never even existed. So the closer, thing, the closer we get to these bizarre times, the more they're going to discount and discredit who he is. And as believers, what we can't forget is when you came to Christ and when you got saved, God indwelled you. Jesus Christ indwelled you in the form of his Holy Spirit. That's who lives inside of you. That's who lives inside of me. So now you have the power to what? To transform. To become Christ-like. So when we talk about becoming Christ-like, yes, you ladies out there, Larry Romero, we talk about becoming Christ-like, we're talking about becoming like this male gender God that we worship and that we serve and that we love, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not a cool thing to talk about nowadays, but it's truth. And if Jesus could be discounted and rejected, that's going to happen. So what happens? You are judged as a sinner at the cross, and now you are going to be judged as a child of God, as a son of God. When? In this life. Those of you that have been through discipleship in our church, uh, lessons one and two, the lesson on salvation and the lesson on eternal security speaks of what was it drive home? What is the theme? Family. Then now you're God's child, that we are now God's children. And God no longer views you or he doesn't perceive you as a sinner. Now you're his child. Now you're his son. And you're either going to be obedient or you're going to be disobedient. Luke 15, right? The story of the prodigal. Show me anywhere in that story where that prodigal ever stopped being the father's son. Although he went wayward, did he not? But when he came back, what did the father do? Man, he ran to him. He embraced him. He loved him. Because God's love for us is unconditional. So in this life, and here it is, you're either an obedient son or you're either an obedient child or a disobedient one. You choose. And you better know, and I better know, and we better realize that whenever we become that prodigal, that there's going to be consequence to that. What was the consequence of the prodigal in Luke 15? What did he end up doing? Where, how and where did he end up? Eating with the pigs. Man, I can't tell you all the believers out there that have walked away from God. That it's like, man, what happened here? Now here's what's interesting. This one speaks of your past. This one speaks of your present. This one speaks of you what? Your future. This is a future judgment. And you know when the judgment seat of Christ is going to happen? Immediately after the rapture. Just like we read in the text, we will stand before him. And you will give an account for what you did or for what you didn't do. These three out of the seven we own. These are ours. Let me show you real quick what the other four are. The fourth one is the judgment of the nation of Israel. We also know that in the Bible is what? The tribulation period. Those seven years that are going to plan. And why, do you, why do you even suppose that the Jews are returning after a 2,600 year diaspora? They're finally going back to the land. You know why? God's preparing the land. Ezekiel 36, he's preparing the people. Ezekiel 37, for this coming tribulation and chaotic time, Ezekiel chapters 39. What is that called? The tribulation period. You know what it plays out in detail in the book of Revelation? Chapters 6 and 19. There's a fifth judgment. This is known as the judgment of the nations. The purpose for the judgment of the nations is so that God could hold to account those nations that were siding with Israel in the tribulation period and those that were against Israel in the tribulation period. We know them in Matthew chapter 25 as the sheep and goat nations, right? Remember that part of the story? That is a prophetic thing as well. And then you get to number six, and this is known as the judgment of the angels. This is going to happen at the very end of the kingdom age, the end of the millennium, where you and I will judge those fallen angels that left with Lucifer way out looking at your timeline in eternity past. And the seventh and final judgment 
we know as the judgment of the what? Of the lost. The judgment of the lost. And who's the judgment of the lost? All those people throughout history that never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. I've said this a number of times and I'll say it again. I don't care if you're black, white, green, red, whatever it is, with God, you, it has nothing to do with race. Isn't it interesting that that's what's being used to divide us like never before? There's only two things that matter in this, in this, this whole church age experience. You either know Him, you're either His child, and you're saved, or you're lost. One of my best friends in ministry is a black man, a guy in Kansas City by the name of Ray Stewart. Man, I love that man dearly. I don't see a black man. You know who I see? A brother in Christ. That's how colorblind God is in this age of grace. And if we would only see the world the way Jesus sees the world, this thing would be solved, man. This, this, everything that we see going on in the world today. You know, what's, you know what the adversary is all about? Exactly what Jesus warned about in John chapter 10, verse 10. That the thief comes to the what? To steal, kill, and destroy. But he comes to do what? To give life and a life more abundantly. That is the God of the Bible. That is the God. This is the New Testament Jesus, man, that has so much to say about this thing. So we will give, I'm sorry. So the last and final judgment is this judgment of the lost. And unfortunately and sadly, we're going to see a lot of people that we love, that we care for, that we know go through this judgment. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to say it again, and I'll say it again. I say it all the time from behind this pulpit. There's only two types of people on the planet. You're either lost or you're saved. You either know Him as your Savior or you don't. Let me give you a couple thoughts as it relates to that. Take, take, take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to look at two verses. Go to Hebrews 9, 27, and then turn to 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. I want to share with you uh, Hebrews 9 first. This is a really key thought, key verse. This is a perspective verse for he, this Hebrews 9 verse. This is what it says. Listen closely. This is the reality. Let me jump ahead a little bit because this is going to be our outline for tonight. This is the reality. This is the, the three points that we're looking at tonight. Let me go ahead and blow this up so you can see me a little bit. But there's three major thoughts that I want us to consider tonight as it relates to Revelation chapters 4, 3 through 11. The reality of this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, the reasons for our judgment, and then we're going to look at what I'm calling the rewards of the judgment. Really key thought to understand as it relates to those as it relates to those crowns, but look at uh, look with me here in uh, Hebrews chapter nine verse twenty seven. Listen closely to these words. It says this, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the what? The judgment. Every man, woman, and child, except those that are going to be raptured will face a judgment lost or saved now turn with me in second timothy chapter four and i'll show you the two different judgments that show up in that passage here's here's the big picture everybody will face a judgment right i'm talking futuristically the issue is which one if you know christ is your savior you will stand before him and again what is known as the judgment seat of Christ. Revelation chapter 4, right after the rapture. If you don't know him, look at your, look at your page 12 again, the big chart. If you look at this last judgment, this little lake of fire thing, that is where Revelation chapter 20 takes place. This is where what we know as, as the great white throne judgment occurs. So look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4. A couple of verses I want us to read together. Is everybody there? Look at these two verses. And this, these are Paul's last words to, that he writes to anybody. Are found in 2 Timothy. So chapter 4 being the last chapter. Are the very last things that he says to this young man that he discipled. Look at this. It says in verse 
Number one, Timothy, I charge thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, watch this, who shall judge the quick, and who else? And the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Are you catching the depth and the profoundness of this truth? Look at your chart again. So he mentions two different people, right? The what? The quick and the dead. Who are the quick? What does the word quick mean? Alive. To be alive. You and I are alive. Why? Because of the, de the resurrection. Eternal life. You are alive. You are the quick. But who are the dead? The lost. Only two types of people. The quick and the dead. Now one group will be judged at his what? At his appearing. What's his appearing? At the rapture. At the rapture of the church. And the other group will be, we will be judged when? Read the text. At the end of his kingdom. It happens at the end of the millennium. Revelation chapter 20, the last couple verses speak of the great white throne judgment, the judgment of the lost. Are you with me? See how practical the Bible is? See how simple it really is if you just kind of compare scripture with scripture and rightly divide the word of truth? So let's talk now and let's start unpacking this judgment seat of Christ thing. The, the whole idea of the reality of it. Again, keep in mind as we just saw in Hebrews chapter 9, each and every one of us will go through a judgment. Every human being in this dispensation known as the church age. You're either saved or you're lost. There is no race in God's eyes. There is no such thing as race. Don't get me wrong. There is, you'll see next week, there is such thing as race but he's colorblind. He doesn't care about your race. You either, you either fall in love with his son or you don't. So, begs the question, which judgment will you be a part of? Will you be present at? So let's look at the two reasons, what I'm calling the two reasons or the two purposes for our judgment, for the judgment seat of Christ. And they're found here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Did I say 4? Um, 2 Corinthians chapter number... Yeah, we're going to go... 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in a minute. And Romans 14. But let me give you the first reason. This is the first and a, perhaps the most significant reason why this judgment is really key and critical. Who can remind me or who can give me another another uh, metaphor, another description for the church. Who said bride? Kristen, good job. She's the bride of Jesus Christ. The whole Ephesians 5 thing is about Christ and the church, the husband and the wife being likened to Christ and the church. Do you remember the third event, the third heavenly event that we're going to talk about? What's the third heavenly event that we're going to talk about in a couple weeks? The marriage what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. You know what that's about? That's going to be the event where Christ marries His bride, His church. Well, guess what? The, the, for one of the primary reasons for the judgment seat of Christ is it's to purify her. It's so that she could be that chaste virgin that Paul wanted to present in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to present the bride of Christ to Jesus, pure and clean and white. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible speaks of this fire that's going to be present and it's going to burn up two of, uh, three of, of six things, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Right? Remember that passage? So three of them are going to exist and continue to exist. Gold, hay, gold, gold, silver, precious stones. And the other three will burn up. Wood, hay, and stubble. That's not writing about hell. That's God's glory burning up the things that didn't matter in our lives and the things that did matter in our, in our lives. You know what gold represents in scripture? It represents his deity. Who he is. He's king. Do you envision and do you embrace the fact that Jesus is the king and sits on the throne of your heart? What's silver? It speaks of redemption. Remember Jesus was given up for 30 pieces of silver? So gold represents 
who he is. Silver represents what he did for you. And the, th the third part is what? Precious stones. You know who the precious stones are? Precious stones are the souls of men and women. They're precious to Jesus. Stones are, people are likened to stones and they're precious to him. And then there's three dead things that are going to show up in our lives. The wood, hay, and stubble that we all tend to allow into our lives that ultimately distract you and keep you from the things that really matter in life. You know what will happen to that stuff? It will burn up. If you think about wood, it's a, what's wood? It's a dead tree. What's hay? Dead grass. What's stubble? It's Clyde's beard. It's a dead beard. Wood, hay, and stubble, man. Dead things. So this is one of the main reasons for the judgment seat of Christ is that the, corporately the body of Christ could be purified before it makes its way to be presented to him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now here's another interesting reason, or here's another reason. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there's only two places where you find the phrase, the judgment seat of Christ. One of them is right here. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look with me in verse, verses 8 through 10. Is everybody there? The, mark these verses down because these are going to help you understand where these show up in the New Testament. So when you're, when you're reading 2 Corinthians, he's writing to who and what? He's writing to a church, right? A church in Corinth. Believers. And this is what he says to the believers in Corinth about the judgment seat of Christ. He says in verse 8, he says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. How many times have we heard that verse or we've made reference to that verse that when somebody dies, immediately they're in the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 9. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be what? We may be accepted of him. So whether you're there or not there, right? The idea is, man, is my life, and that's the issue, and that's the question, is my life glorifying Him? Not accepting you as His child. That was done at the cross, right? But man, is what I'm doing worthy, or is it wood, hay, stubble, or is it gold, silver, precious stones? Look at this. Wherefore we labor. So this is about your what? This is about your works, your effort. And let me, let me, let me qualify this. In Christianity, in biblical Christianity, you don't work for salvation. That was done on the cross. I keep pointing that way because we have a cross over there in the corner. You don't work for salvation. That's a free gift through grace given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? We know that. We believe that. We don't work for salvation. We work because of salvation. We embrace who we are in Christ and our journey and our mission and our purpose becomes now about Him and glorifying Him with what? With the gifts that He's given you. Through ministry, through faithfulness, through commitment. And all those things that we're called to be and all those things that we're called to do. Look at the rest of the verse. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent that we may be accepted of Him. For look at this, verse number 10. For we must all, who's all? Everybody in this room will give an account. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone, mark this folks, that everyone may receive the things that were done in his body according to that that he had done, whether it be what? Whether it be good or bad. Are you getting the picture here? You get one crack at life. I think the average lifespan of, the Ameri of an American is 78.2 years. What are you doing with the one life that God gives you? This is the issue. That's the question for you and for me. Just a few weeks ago, we were talking about purpose, right? And perspective. And man, if we forget our purpose like Israel did, going into the promised land and why God made them who they were, 
and gave them a place to live and did what he did with them, man, all of a sudden we find ourselves just kind of existing, just kind of just getting through with life, surviving, right? How many of us are just in survival mode right now when God really is on the throne still? still desiring to use us for his glory, but we're caught up in all the craziness and all the stuff that is distracting us and keeping us from the one thing that matters. And you know what that is? The souls of men and women. The precious stones, the gold, the silver, the things that matter in this life. We will stand before him and we will give an account according to that which he had done, whether it be good or bad. You know, one of my favorite scenes in any movie ever is a scene in the movie gladiator if you remember the movie if you've not ever seen it at the very i highly recommend the movie because man talk about a movie that speaks so much about courage and strength and character at the very very beginning of the movie um his name is uh gosh what's the name of of the actor that plays uh uh no the 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 russell what's his name Russell Crowe, yeah. Russell Crowe plays the part of the general and he's up on the hilltop and he's ready to lead a cavalry unit down into the valley to attack these Germanic barbarian hordes. And as he's preparing them to go down, he, he brings perspective to the scenario. You know what he says to them? He says, hey men, and he's trying to bring some levity to the situation because he knows they might die. He says, he says to them, man, if you find yourselves walking through green fields in this, with the sun in your face? He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Why? Because you are an Elysium, he says. Well, Elysium was the Roman concept of heaven. And then everybody just kind of laughs and they kind of chuckle and he says, all right, now I'm going to say something really profound. He goes, he says this next to him. He says, men, never forget this truth. He says, whatever you do, never forget this, that whatever you do in this life will what? will echo through eternity. Did you catch that? What a powerful concept that is. That whatever we do in this life will echo in eternity. So your life matters. Your focus matters. What you focus on, what you think about, what you pray about, what you meditate on, what you ponder matters. Because that's going to determine where we end up here. Because look at how the verse ends. I, I love this. It says here in this phrase, right smack in the, in the text, right here in verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may what? May receive the things which were done in his body. What are those things? What are those things that you're receiving in this life? Anybody have any clue? Any idea? They're crowns. The crowns that we read about in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. Those crowns that are going to be cast at his feet. And sadly enough, there will be some of us that are going to stand before him at this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, with one, maybe two crowns. And then there's going to be those believers from couple generations ago the Philadelphia church ages as we know it that are just going to have wheelbarrows full man because of their faithfulness and their commitment their love for Christ their heart their character their faithfulness wow the judgment seat of Christ we will and you are right now as we speak receiving these things so it begs the question, what are these things? You heard Arlene speak up. The crowns. There are five crowns. Five and only five crowns that you earn in this life. That you will take into eternity. Into heaven. Spiritual crowns, mind you. So that you're going to take into eternity. That you have the privilege of casting at the foot of Jesus. It's really cool. I just saw Danielle walk in and Marvin showed me some pictures, some some pictures of his, some graduation pictures of where he's wearing his letterman's jacket, right? Man, decked out. Talk about a studly looking dude. You know what those are? Those are rewards. 
those are crowns. You just saw the word rewards here. You're, you're, you're earning rewards in this life, whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, whether you believe it or not. Because one of these days, according to Romans 14 and 2 Corinthians 5, you will stand before Him. I will stand before Him and give an account, corporately as the church to purify us, but individually to say to God, what did I do with my life? Remember Revelation 4.11? You were created for one thing. What is that? Remind me somebody. To glorify Him. So this is how you glorify Him. You glorify Him by receiving, by we receiving these crowns. And here are the crowns. There's five of them. There's the crown of righteousness. And you find this mentioned specifically in 2 Timothy chapter 4 in verse number 8. And this is a crown that is given for those who love Him and can't wait to see Him. I made a comment last Sunday in church and somebody kind of called me on it, right? I go, you know, I, I want to see Jesus in this life more than I care. I'm glad we all got together in the last couple of weeks and I'm seeing some of you again for the first time in a long time. And I love you guys dearly with all my heart. And I believe me, I missed you. But man, not like I miss him. And there's a crown given to those that can't wait to experience who and what he's about. And that's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 8. Right after he mentions, Paul mentions to Timothy the judgments of the quick and the dead at his appearing and in his kingdom. The second crown that you find is known as the crown of life. Revelation chapter 2.10. It's also referred to or known as what I'll refer to as the martyr's crown. These are people that have died in the last 2,000 years being persecuted for who they are, for their belief and their love for Christ. I don't really know if the church in this age will experience the persecution that has been experienced in times past, but I think it's very likely as we continue to head down this path and people begin to question and doubt what we believe and what we do and what we teach and they're going to look to us and look at us as the cause of the problems in this world and not realize that we're simply here, man, to see them come to Christ so that they don't have to experience that tribulation period so that we could give them a purpose and give them hope allow them to transform so it's going to get really interesting in the coming weeks and months as we consider that crown number three is known as the inter the incorruptible crown also known as the crown of temperance these are this is a crown given to those believers, man, that are just able to, what? Just kind of keep their cool, man. They're not emotionally driven in anything and everything that is going on in their lives. One of the fruit of the Spirit, right in Galatians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, is temperance. It's the last one that is mentioned, right? There's, there are nine of them, nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and the last one that is mentioned is temperance. Temperance is that ability, man, to just keep your cool in spite of whatever. Isn't it amazing and crazy what we've witnessed on the news this last week? And the anger and the frustration and the lack of temperance on the planet where emotions and feelings are driving everybody bonkers, man. tell you what if you want people to hear the message of hope the message of the gospel come from you you better be temperate in how you reach out to them and how you approach them or they'll reject your message the minute you walk in the door if you're walking in with with a scowl or a frown or frustrated or hatred or anger so it's important, it's imperative that we realize and that we experience what it is that we're doing. Crown number four is known as the 
crown of rejoicing, also known as the soul winner's crown. Every time you lead somebody to Christ and that person leads somebody else to Christ and that person leads somebody else to Christ and who knows the people that are in your life that you have led to Christ that are going to be a part of this relationship, this life at the judgment seat of Christ as we present them to Jesus Christ. Can I show you this passage in 1 Thessalonians? It's really pretty powerful. Turn with me in your Bibles to this, to this chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Man, I love this chapter. This is the second coming chapter. This is the, this is not chapter, this is the, the, the rapture letter. This is a letter written to a church that was confused about the return of Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church. And Paul is shedding so much light and so much perspective. This is why you find the rapture mentioned in chapter 4 and the hope that we can only have of of being with him in chapter number five and not going through his through God's wrath. But look at chapter two, verses uh, I think it's verse nine, number nineteen specifically, which is the last verse. Uh, but um, look at how it reads; it's really cool. Um, look at verse number seventeen. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Isn't that a a cool concept that Paul always had a love connection with people? Just desiring to see them, just wanting to be around the people of God. Look at verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Again, your adversary will do anything from keeping us connected. Isn't that interesting how this whole thing played out the last couple months and how effective it's been and how it's been? I reached out to a few folks, hey, inviting them back to church tonight. And um, a couple of them said, you know what? I just kind of like laying in my bed and watching it on TV. Whatever. The Bible also tells us, forsake not the what? The assembling of yourselves, man. This matters. You know, I'm reminded of the, the book of Third John where John writes about, man, I can't wait to see you face to face. Isn't it incredible that one of the most powerful and incredible truths that you find in the Bible is the power of touch and how many people Jesus touched and they were healed just by touching. And now we're told that we can't do what? We can't hot touch. Embracing each other, John writes about, with a holy kiss. It's crazy how effective it's been in keeping us together or keeping us apart. Change my view. That view or that view? Okay. Right, Marvin? That's why you're better at this than me. (laughs) So look with me at the rest of this passage. It's pretty awesome. Verse number 18, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. He will do anything to keep us apart. Verse 19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Isn't that cool? Watch this. Or crown of rejoicing. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his what? At his coming? What event do you think he's referring to? The rapture. That's right, Irene, exactly. Look at the next verse. For ye are glory and joy. Isn't that awesome? You are that crown. You are that crown. When we stand together before Christ, the people that you've led to Christ, they're going to be standing next and you're going to say, right, Lord, here, here he is, here she is, for your glory. Isn't that a cool concept? the lives that have been touched and affected throughout history, throughout your own personal histories. What a powerful and incredible crown. That's known as the soul winner's crown or the crown of rejoicing. And the last crown that is mentioned is the crown of glory in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, also known as the what? The shepherd's crown. It's really cool to see Marie Gutierrez here who just came to Christ, what, it's been two years, right, Marie? No, actually, a, little, a little bit over, in April, whenever it was, two years ago. 
got under Sylvia's wing. Sylvia Barilla discipled her. She grew immediately, blossomed, and just, what was it, three months ago, right before Christmas, we put somebody in her life for who for her to disciple Ebony. And man, Ebony came to me the other day and said, man, I can't tell you how grateful you are for putting Marie in my life. You know what that is? That's a shepherd's crown. She's a shepherd, an overseer of her soul. Can I show you something really interesting in Scripture as it relates to this crown? Really profound and fascinating truth. Look in your Bibles at John chapter 21. This is one of the most heartwarming stories that I've ever read. As a matter of fact, whenever we go to the church of, it's known as the Church of Reconciliation or Restoration on the Sea of Galilee, on the northern end of the sea, um, they've placed a church where it is, by tradition, said that Peter met with Jesus after his denial of him. And I want you to listen closely and consider what plays out in the story and what it is that Jesus says to Peter about this new purpose and this new role that he has for him. At this point of the story, I think you're all familiar with it. Jesus warned the disciples in John chapter 16 that in the next few days, they would be scattered. The things were going to get chaotic in their lives. Remember that? In chapter 16, verse 33, he says, Man, I just want to give you my peace. Just keep your heart at peace, but things are going to get crazy and nutty. Remember that verse? He says, But don't let your hearts be troubled, for I have already overcome the world. What a promise that is. That because of who he is, because of what he's done for us, we are already overcomers. We're already victorious in Christ's eyes. But I don't have to tell you, man, that a couple days later after the, after the Last Supper, things got really nutty and bizarre. And one of the guys that got caught up in the chaos and in the darkness was none other than the leader of the Twelve, Peter. This is the main guy. And when he was confronted about who Jesus was, in the Gospel of Matthew, and they said, he's one of his followers, what did Peter do? He denied him three times. And Jesus had warned him that it, when you hear that cock crow three times, after the third time, it's going to be the third denial that you've imposed on Christ. And as Peter heard that cock crow, man, the Bible says that he wept bitterly because he knew that he had denied the one that meant everything to him. And you know what Peter did next in his journey and in his life? He went back home north. Not to Espanola, not to Powake, but where? To Galilee. And you know what he was doing when Jesus shows up in his life again here in John 21? Anybody know what he was doing? Fishing. He was fishing. You know what he did? He went back doing the only thing that he knew to do. He was a fisherman. Remember when Jesus called him out at the very beginning in the Gospel of John? He says, follow me and I'm going to make you what? Fishers. Fishers of men. That's this. That's this crown, the soul winner's crown. Fishing for souls. But when Jesus meets up with him in John chapter 21, this is a really cool story. It's no longer about just being a, fishers, a fisherman about being a fishers of men. Look at how the story plays out. It says this, it says here in verse number, I'm, see, where do I want to, where do I want to start? Um, let's just start at the very beginning. Verse one, and after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise he showed he himself. So Jesus himself, after the resurrection, went home. He went to Galilee. That's the Sea of Tiberias. Look at verse 2. And there were together Simon, Peter, and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, and all the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. And Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. 
They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and they entered into a ship immediately and that night they caught nothing. They went back doing the only thing they knew to do, man, after spending three and a half with, years with Jesus. Knowing that he had denied his Savior, he goes home and you can, I guarantee, man, just like that prodigal was living a miserable life. Probably couldn't even focus on where and how to cast his nets. Man, you end up catching nothing. No fruit. Verse 4. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And what's really cool, when you go to where tradition says this event occurred, there's three stones in the shape of a heart right on the beach. Three heart-shaped stones. And you'll see why in a minute. Watch this. I love going there. I just like, there's like this little garden area and I just like to sit in the garden and just ponder this story because it is an awesome story. It is a cool story. It is how God deals with us. Look at verse number five. And when Jesus saith unto them, children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find and they cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved John right saith unto Peter it is the Lord now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord he girt his fisher's coat unto him for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea man he was Here's a Norteño word for us in New Mexico. He was in Peloto, on the boat. What's the significance of nakedness, though, in the Bible? Say it again, Sylvia. Shame. He was living in a life of shame. And when he realized it was Jesus, he puts on a coat. And what does he do? He dives into the water. Watch this. This is so cool. And the other disciples, they came in a little ship for they were not far from the land, but as it were, 200 cubits dragging the nets with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid there on, and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and he drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. Man, that's a cool number. I'll have to talk to you about what that represents someday. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And Jesus saith unto them, Look at this, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? And the first thing that Jesus says to them is, Come, man. Come have fellowship with me again. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that cool? Man, never... When you're going through difficult times, times of denial, times of rejection, times in your life where you're that prodigal and you're wondering and you're doubting or you're questioning whether or not he loves you, believe me, he loves you, man, unconditionally. And finally he says, come, man, come, come have fellowship with me and look at this next verse. And Jesus saith on come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? And Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. Verse 15. So when they had dined, or as they're done eating, they just had their fish fry, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? More than these, he saith unto him, Yea, Lord. Isn't that cool? He knew who he was. He goes, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus says this to him. This is his reply. He saith unto him, Then what? Feed my lambs. Look at the next verse. He saith to him again, The second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Then feed my what? Feed my sheep. In other words, you got to feed those baby Christians. And then you feed the babies. Are you getting the picture here? He's turning Peter from being a fisherman to a what? 
to a shepherd. You go from evangelizing, but you better be discipling. Because it's in discipleship where you become the caretaker of someone's soul. Look at the next verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest thou without, and thou wouldest, and when thou would, and thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee, whether thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying. Um, oh, did I did I jump way ahead? I did, didn't I? Uh, I actually I wanted to be in verse seventeen, and he saith unto him the third time, three times, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter grieved. Because he said unto him the third time, Lord, why are you asking me three times? You know that I love you. Aren't you getting it, Lord? Then feed my sheep, Jesus said. Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, then feed my what? Sheep three times. Why three times? You know, Michelle? He was denied three times. And you know what Jesus is all about? Reconciliation. He brings everything back into balance. Become that shepherd, Peter. And my goodness, go study the book of Acts and see what this man became. Here he spends three and a half years right smack in the midst of Jesus. And when things went to hell in a handbasket, he was one of the first guys to bail. But man, he becomes one of the most incredible human beings to take the gospel to the world in the early part of the book of Acts before Paul begins to show up. <clears throat> the shepherd's crown. This is who and what Jesus is about. This is what matters in life. Discipling. Those of you out there that are husbands, that are fathers, man, disciple your children. Disciple those that God puts in your lives. Invest. This is what we're called to be. This is what we're called to do. Well, it's 20 till. I want to leave one final thought with you. I'm going to take you to an interesting place in the scriptures and I'm going to qualify what I'm about to share by simply saying that what I'm about to share with you out of the Old Testament is not something that I would preach or teach dogmatically or doc doctrinally from a church role and responsibility standpoint, but I want to share this thought with you. I wanted to just ponder what we're about to say. But there are six questions that are found in the Bible lumped together that I believe can only be answered by the believer. Job's asking these questions. But if you consider the text, there's only one group of people in all of history that could answer this quest, these questions. Look with me in Job chapter number 26. And I'm going to leave you with this thought. So in bringing tonight to a close, three events. Judgment seat of Christ. Kathy's question was, what are we going to be doing in heaven? Just hanging out, playing harps, hanging out, just having a good time? No. The first event will be this event that we discussed tonight. But look at the text here in Job chapter 26 because... It's a fascinating passage to me, man, and there's only one group of people in all of history. When you look at this timeline that we keep throwing up on page number 12, there's only one group of people. There's only one group of people that could answer these questions, and you'll see one of them. You know who that is? The believer. The believer. Look with me here in verse... Number 1 of chapter 26. Verse 1. But Job answered and said. Look at verse 2. Question number 1. How hast thou helped him that is without power? Did you catch that? Who are those that, that are without power? You know why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit of God. So the question is, how hast thou helped him that is without power? How have we helped a lost person in this crisis, this week, in this time, 
and giving them an opportunity to come to know Christ so that we could again look at this crown over here, the soul winner's crown, right? See them come to Christ so that you could stand and, you, and present them to Jesus someday as one of your crowns of rejoicing. <laughs> look at question number two. And this is why I believe it's a question that could only be answered by the believer. Look at number two. How savest thou? This is in verse two. How savest thou the arm that hath no strength? What's the significance of the arm? It's part of what? It's part of the body. What is the body likened to or what's another name given to the church in the New Testament? The body of Christ. The people in our body whose arm has no strength. The hands and the arms are always a picture spiritually of how it is that we serve and how it is that we minister. This is when the priests were, were told to, as they were making their way into the holy place and in the most holy place, they were only told to wash things, their hands and their feet, because of what it represents. And think about those that are in our body or part of the body who have no strength. Look at question number three in verse three. How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? A lot of smart people on, in the world on the planet, huh? But nowadays, there ain't a whole heck of a lot of wisdom, man. I'll tell you what, man. I watch some of the stuff that's being said and being done at the highest levels of government, man. And it's just nuts and crazy. The things that just are so contradictory and hypocritical and just the lack of wisdom is so profound and is so prevalent I'm just I'm amazed and we are we are told or we're asked the question how have you provided ga guidance or counseling to those that have no wisdom we don't have time tonight to get into the whole knowledge wisdom and understanding balance that you find in the book of Proverbs but my goodness man this world lacks wisdom like never before and look at question number four in verse Number three, and how <clears throat> hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? How are we declaring the gospel? The only hope that a lost and dying world has. How are we declaring it is the question that is being asked in the text. Question number five, verse number four. To whom hast thou uttered words? How many people do we bypass or ignore each and every day in our lives? The homeless guy on the street, the feeble people in your lives. He says, How, to whom hast thou uttered words? And the last question, and here's an interesting question that's asked, and whose spirit came from thee? Wow. Is it God's spirit or your spirit driving this train? So there it is, folks. Judgment seat of Christ. Event number one out of three events, out of three heavenly things that will be occurrences that will be happening in the heavenlies as things go crazy and bizarre on planet earth from chapter 6 revelation 6 all the way to 19 so next week we will be looking at this book that plays a significant role and purpose i'm liking it or i'm referring to it as the seven sealed book this is going to help answer um the second part of kathy's question can we see what's actually taking place on earth yes you will and it's with the second event that we're going to talk about next week in Revelation chapter number 5 where we're going to point to that very issue or that very part of her question. Alright? We're finishing a little bit early. Michelle has a question. Go shoot, Michelle. Go ahead. I'm going to repeat it so that everybody else can hear it. Go ahead. So if we're going to see what's going to happen in the 
going on on earth. Yes. When we're raptured, we're given a new body. What about a memory? Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say yeah. is we can see, can we see loved ones that... Here's, here's Michelle's question, and it's a great question. Will we witness and will we see a lot of these events playing out that we're going to talk about them next week in Revelation chapter 5. This is where you're going to find the seven seals mentioned for the first time. They're actually applied on the planet in Revelation chapter number 6. But there's an occurrence happening in chapter 5 where the seven seals are, se are seals on a book. We're going to talk about the significance of that book. Now Michelle's question is, are we going to ha see these events affecting the people that we love or the people that we know? And also the second part of her question is, will we have memory of that? You and I believe if you look at the entire rest of the book of Revelation, you will see that as we'll see next week. So you got to come for that so you can see how that's going to play out. But you will also have a memory all the way in to the end of the last judgment in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne. And it's in chapter 21 where everything is new again. Where tears are wiped away. Where there's no more pain and there's no more suffering. Up until then, I really believe even as heavenly glorified being bodies, we will be able to experience the, the pain and the heartache of what we'll witness. Tears, if you will. Because those aren't washed away until when? The very end of the book, Revelation 21. When there's a new heaven and a new earth. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So, you're going to have a glorified body. You're going to have a mind like Christ. So you're going to be able to, you know what? Jesus felt pain. When, G when, P when Jesus saw people hurting, he hurt. Remember the story of... Of, um, of Jesus and, and Lazarus and the, the shortest verse in the Bible, John chapter number 11, verse number 42, 43, where it says that Jesus did what? Jesus wept. Not just cried, he wept because of the pain and suffering. Look at the words that we just read in Job 26. Imagine being asked these questions, man. Talk about emotion. Talk about feelings. Talk about heartache. Reminders of, man, where we fail each and every day. So this, this event's coming, man. Everything that we talked about tonight is going to happen. And this is what I love about God's Word, man. It allows us to sometimes just take a step back and look at the big picture and look at the things that really, really matter in this life. Could I share with you one passage and we'll close? Everybody turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Man, talk about perspective, man. This Paul guy, he's my hero. He's writing this letter, reminding the church in Corinth, man, that there is this dark night. I'm talking about this adversary. And this is an important passage because this is going to be a good segue to next week. Because I want you to listen closely to what the devil, what Satan is referred to in the text. Look with me here in verse number one. He says, in chapter four of Second Corinthians, therefore seeing that we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, of not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, count, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Did you catch that charge? that we have a responsibility to be those proclaimers. Look at the next verse. But if our gospel be hid, right? What's the gospel? The good news, which is what? The death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus Christ died for the world and resurrected for their eternal life on the third day. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what people need to hear. But you know what Paul says in this verse? That the gospel's hid to the lost. Why is it hid, is the question. Look at the next verse. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Why? Because in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, 
who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sakes. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's our message. God is glorified when, he, when people begin to come to Christ. And then he goes through the next, the rest of the chapter and he begins to talk about as you go and you journey out to do exactly what he said to do in terms of glorifying God, you're going to experience trials. You're going to experience distress. You're going to experience hardship persecution he's he talks about all that stuff look with me down in verse 9 he says i'm going to be persecuted but not forsaken i'm going to be cast down but not destroyed always bearing about in the body of the dying of the lord jesus that the life also of jesus might be made manifest in our body jump down to verse number 15 for all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of god for which cause we faint not, but through our out, but though our outward man perish, man, our body is failing us each and every day, right? Went on a hike the other day, man, down the Windsor Trail from the Borrego up in Hyde Park home. Man, you would have thought that I climbed Everest when I got home. Man, I was hurt. My knee swelled up. I was hurting for two days. Watch this. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed. When? Day by day. Look at verse number 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, right? The rejection, the persecution, it's for a moment. Watch this. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why do you exist? To glorify God. That's why you were created. Last verse. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Now, there is a great verse. What are you focusing on? The craziness and the nuttiness of this world? Who's gonna, you're, are you more concerned about who's going to be president in November than you are about the souls that are in your neighborhood and the people that you love and care for? Look what he says. Look at this. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. They're temporal. Governments come and go. Presidents come and go. Congressmen come and go. Congresswomen come and go. God's the ones putting them in place anyway, right? Daniel chapter 2 verse 25. But those things, he says, are temporal. But look at this. But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Are eternal. You know what that eternal thing is? You know what matters? Everything that we've talked about tonight. The souls of men and women. Those precious stones. The glory of God. Gold, silver, precious stones. That's all that matters. That's what's going to live eternally. That's what's going to exist eternally. And we get so caught up, man, in everything and anything. You know, what, you know what that is? That is nothing more than a massive, huge distraction from the adversary to get our eyes off the mission, to get our eyes off our purpose, which is to what? I pray that we're able to answer those six questions. If in fact those are the questions, I don't know. Seems to me that they're there for a reason, they're in God's word for a reason, and there's only one group of people in all history that can answer those questions, and that's the believer. All right? Kathy Pino, good question. Again, next week we're going to look at chapter 5, and we're going to look at this interesting little book that has seven seals on it as we consider the second of three heavenly events again getting back to the very beginning of the evening her question was are what are we going to be doing in heaven with the lord during the tribulation period we saw the first of three events tonight you will be standing before him giving an account of your life. What did you do with this one life that his, he gave you? And the second part, are we going to see what's taking place on earth? This is what we'll answer next week, okay? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight, for your grace, your love, your mercy towards us. And Lord, I'm just so grateful for the truths in your word. Thank you for revealing to us, Lord God, um, why, where we came from, why we are here, 
And Lord Jesus, where we're going, I look forward to the day, Lord, where we get to be with you and spend it with you eternally. For it's in Jesus' name, Lord, we ask these things. Amen. Amen.